Welcome to this episode of ACG's Growth TV. I'm Katie Mulligan, Content Director for ACG's Media Group. My guest today is Penny Pritzker, the founder and chairman of PSP Partners and its affiliates, Pritzker Realty Group, PSP Capital, and PSP Growth. Penny is a member of the well-known Pritzker family in Chicago and has continued in the family tradition by launching a number of businesses over the course of her career. She served as Secretary of Commerce under President Obama and today is a member of several corporate boards, including Microsoft, and she continues to be an active civic leader and philanthropist. Penny, thanks for joining me on Growth TV. It's great to talk with you. Oh, thanks so much for having me. So I want to start by asking you about a topic that is debated quite a bit, and I think that's especially relevant right now, um, which is the role that government should play in creating a healthy business climate in the U.S. As a longtime business leader yourself, who's also served as a public official leading the Commerce Department under Obama, I'm interested to hear what you think about the government's role in the economy, plus any government-led initiatives that you'd point to as success stories. Well, that's a really good question. You know, look, I'll say fundamentally, I do not believe it is the role of government to create jobs. I believe that's the role of the private sector. But it is the role of government to create the conditions for economic growth. You know, government can pass laws on investment, on R&D, on trade, on taxes, on export controls, on immigration, on workforce training, to name just a few. Um, And the scale at which the government acts can create a climate that makes business uh, have the opportunity to be more successful or create a better climate for business across the country. You know, for example, if you think about initiatives like the passage of the Federal Infrastructure Law, the Chips and Science Act, or the Inflation Reduction Act, all of which happened last year, they've infused enormous amounts of money into our economy, more than a trillion dollars of investments uh, that have started to occur and will occur over the next five to 10 years that make a huge difference and create a lot of opportunity for business. Uh, That type of innovation policy is something that I've called for for a number of years and think that it creates a lot of opportunity for our businesses. It's up to the private sector then to react to those opportunities. So, for example, if you thought about the CHIPS Act, you're seeing the private sector invest alongside government dollars, I think, to the tune of more than $200 billion in places like Ohio and Arizona and Texas and all across different parts of our country. And that's helping you know create jobs across uh, the country, if you will. If you look at history, for example, how do government investments impact industry? And let's take, for example, the Defense Department at DARPA, you know, investments by the federal government helped create the basis for the internet or GPS technologies and things like that. And it's my hope that the investments that have been recently made through the Chips and Science Act, the Infrastructure Act, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, are and those made in quantum, et cetera, will help us really innovate in areas like quantum, broadband, AI, and others. Hmm. And you've been a a vocal advocate for tech and innovation, like you mentioned, while you were at Commerce and more recently as an advisor to President President Biden and within Chicago's tech community too. Um, So I want to ask you about the state of funding in the tech sector. You know, we've had a, a difficult few years for tech companies and seen a slowdown in venture capital fundraising. So I wonder, Penny, if you see an opportunity here for growth equity and, and buyout funds to step in to back some of these late stage tech companies and support the technological innovation in the U.S. that, that you were just speaking to. Well, first, let me step back and give a little context. You know, we see ourselves at PSP as Um, in the business of building opportunity. And we have a portfolio of businesses that we focus on in areas like business and technology services, advanced industrials, and real estate, as well as um, I helped found a real estate private equity firm called Artemis and a venture capital firm called Inspired Capital. And 
you know, it's our belief that in order for us to be successful and, and, you know, we we have a great team. We've put together a great team that uh, allows us to have this broad area of activities. Um, and our activities focus not just on growth investing, but also on value investing. And we have about two dozen businesses and partnerships in our portfolio, you know, including companies like Antiva, which is a leading managed IT services firm that addresses you know, the opportunities created by digital transformation demand, or StormTrap, which is stormwater management business that's addressing the grow, our growing need across our country to manage and treat water in the face of extreme weather and events. Um, both of those investments reflect our strategy of investing thematically, if you will, in sectors and businesses where we believe PSP ha can be a value-added partner where we can leverage our global network, where we can share our expertise and resources to help our management partners uh, be able to grow uh, their businesses. We've been exposed to both growth and stable and private equity type businesses, and we're active in those sectors. What we see is, you know, frankly, the tech sector may be having uh, challenges in the short run, but in the long run, we think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity, particularly for companies that are building durable business models and have an enduring value proposition. Um, there may be share periods where shareholders don't value those businesses as highly, but it doesn't mean those businesses don't have an authentic right to exist or win over uh, the long term. Now, as it relates to, so we're bullish on the tech sector, and we think the downturn could create a really great opportunity for us to invest and build businesses because talent may be more available. Revenue, while revenue budgets are tighter, often the revenue can be stickier because the people are buying solutions that they feel have the highest return on investment at times like these. And um, so we think it's a good time to be building tech businesses. Having said that, there are way too many me too businesses out there that are solving, I would call marginal problems or solving a problem that someone else is doing a better job of. And I think those businesses are really going to struggle uh, because access to capital is just much, much more difficult. Where you're seeing capital, capital is, you know, there's a flight to quality. The best businesses are going to continue to get funding and have the right to exist. But poor performing businesses or businesses that are just, you know, another version of something that already exists are really going to struggle, I think, in this environment. Hmm. And you you touched on the sectors in which PSP focuses and also some of the companies that you've partnered with. Um, I wonder if within those spaces, whether there are any subsectors where you see especially strong opportunities for investment and growth this year. Yes. Well, as I said, you know, we focus in business and technology services, advanced industrials and real estate are our primary areas of focus. And we've chosen those areas because we think, you know, if you really look at the, there's just terrific tailwinds over the long haul for those areas. Where we see opportunity in 2023 and over the next years is first, I'll say, in digital transformation services. Um, Companies are going to and are currently making technology investments to improve their efficiency, to drive innovation, and they're going to continue to do so. And we think that's an area of great opportunity, not only for large enterprises, but for small businesses as well. We're also spending a lot of time in infrastructure services. You know, with the passage of uh, the Federal Infrastructure Act, with the really deferred investment that many of our cities and states have made, we think that there's a continued opportunity over the next decade uh, to provide solutions to uh, companies that are servicing the, the infrastructure sector. Um, 
We also believe there's significant opportunity in industrial warehousing. We do not think the e-commerce uh, transformation is over. We also think that the American supply chain is continuing to evolve, uh, particularly given the challenges that we faced during uh, COVID. We continue in our real estate group to be focused on warehousing, building, acquiring, and managing warehouses and cold storage asset in important metros. We think that's an area with, that's got a lot of opportunity. And our buyout group thinks that there's uh, also a uh, significant uh, potential in providing products and services to commercial and industrial warehouses. Um, I also think with the shortage of labor that the country is facing and decreasing productivity, there's an opportunity in proper tech and in other areas of technology um, to help provide either access to labor or greater visibility on material availability or uh, dealing with uh, payment uh, lumpiness, if you will. And so we think there's a lot of opportunity in uh, technology solutions and services. Finally, you know, areas where we've not done as much, but that we believe there's a huge business are in climate tech. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I think the world is going to continue to look for cleaner materials uh, and software that helps you track and measure impact. Um, and then, of course, there's artificial intelligence, which I think is going to affect all of our businesses. It'll be hard to figure out exactly how to invest in artificial intelligence, but I think it is going to be used in so many of our different uh, sectors. Hmm. That was fascinating insight into the areas that you're watching. Um, switching gears a little bit, you know, at Commerce, you were focused on expanding growth and opportunities for Americans, which seems to also be a guiding focus for you and your colleagues at your investment firm, PSP. Um, can you talk about the culture you set out to build at PSP and, and how you and your team codified the values of the firm? You know, honestly, I think the core value that we have at our firm is we believe in the value to society of building businesses and creating opportunity. We believe it's actually noble to build a business uh, to invest in growth and innovation, and to create jobs. Uh, it helps create opportunity for not only the individuals in our firm, but their families, our partners, our wider community, our employees. Uh, and so, you know, culture is something that is absolutely core to who we are. I, I have the privilege of sitting on the Microsoft board and constantly learning from the CEO, Satya Nadella. And he says, you know, that the C in CEO stands for culture and that culture eats strategy for lunch. I could not agree more. And so we try constantly to reinforce uh, our culture in our, in our company. And our culture begins with valuing team. And I'm proud to say we have a great team here. Troy Nord, Michael Ashansky, Mo Q, uh, John Skinner, Peter Berghoff, uh, Don Trobert, uh, Carolyn Greenberg. I mean, just a great group of leaders in our firm. And for us, and I do mean us, not just me as a leader, culture is everything. It starts with being a values-based organization. And we recently under, we went through an exercise that we're really proud of, where our entire team, not just our leadership, everybody in the company, no matter the position, we came together and we discussed the values that we believe in. What does PSP stand for? What do we stand for? And that exercise was so heartening. Um, and what it did was it helped us to articulate our values more clearly. And those, and that came, as I said, from the bottoms up, not top down. It's helped inform our new work. Uh, website. It's helped us be clearer about what we believe in. And we came up with uh, an articulation of our values in an acronym, IDEALS, mm -hmm. integrity, diversity, excellence, alignment, leadership, and service. And as I said, I'm really proud that this is not, this is something that our entire team worked on uh, and helped articulate. And it's it just brings a big smile to my face 
And now we actually talk in these terms. We congratulate each other and and we actually do shout outs at least once a week to folks in the firm who have demonstrated uh, one of our ideals. So it's really become a very valuable uh, tool for us. And it just underscores to, that our firm is really committed to our values. And I know it's something that a, a lot of investment firms right now are either working on or struggling with. So that's helpful to hear how that process looked for, for PSP. Um, I want to go back to one of the values you mentioned as part of ideals, which is diversity. Um, and to ask you about that in the context of corporate boards, um, you serve on several boards. We talked about Microsoft, um, but statistically women remain pretty much underrepresented in these positions. So I wonder in your view, Penny, what it will take to change that and whether you have any advice for women who are seeking a, a position on a board? Well, first of all, I encourage, you know, uh, every situation I'm in, I'm encouraging more and more women to uh, not only become business leaders, but also join corporate boards. And flip side, on the boards that I sit on, I'm really encouraging those boards to diversify their membership and include more women and people from different backgrounds and knowledge bases. The first thing you have to do in order to get greater diversity is be intentional. And I really learned that um, when I was in government. Uh, Barack Obama as president really insisted that his cabinet not only be diverse, but that we build diverse teams. And what I saw in that experience was the ideas, the recommendations were much richer, much better, much more nuanced uh, because of the diversity in the room. Because, and diversity doesn't mean you just have a diverse set of people in the room. You also have to celebrate diversity. You have inclusion. You have to empower people. You have to believe that doing so helps us all become a better organization and make better decisions. And um, it, there's no doubt in my mind, and the data shows it, that more diverse boards and leadership perform better. Um, you know, I've been involved in two companies where my partners are women, uh, both are uh, real estate private equity firm Artemis, and my partner Deb Harmon, um, and our uh, venture capital firm, where my partner is Alexa Van Tobel. Both are committed to building diverse teams. And Artemis, in fact, was really founded with the idea that not only were we going to build best in class middle market real estate private equity firm, which I think we're achieving, but also that we were going to do so with a diverse team. And we know real estate has notoriously been, you know, uh, a more male dominated field. Uh, and so we really decided as two women that if we were going to start a firm that we were going to also try and impact our, our industry, which has been great. Um, I think in terms of getting more women in leadership, Besides the data and making sure that everyone understands that the return on investment for women for companies that have more women on their boards, more diversity on their boards is better. You know, I think that we need more women CEOs. Um, women are more likely to build gender diverse boards. Um, I also think we have to really continue to target opportunities for adding women, setting timelines, being clear um, with investors that we're committed to diversity. And, and certainly you see that as being more and more a subject of um, board evaluation firms is looking at the diversity on a board. Um, I think as boards, you have to have objective criteria for your board. And I think if you expand your criteria to have criteria, not necessarily a quota around diversity, but evaluating different um, either skill sets, backgrounds, uh, and capabilities that are needed on a board. You're, you should end up with a more diverse board. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think that you have to encourage your board, particularly your non-gov committees, to go outside their immediate networks, because we tend to know people who are like ourselves. 
And that I think is where search firms can be helpful. They can help introduce you to new uh, people, open your aperture to new networks, uh, and um, which I think can be helpful. And finally, I just think you have to get started and you have to build momentum. And if you add a qualified woman to your board, chances are the second one is going to be more interested. Um, so it's really something uh, that I think is imminently doable. I know a ton of women who are interested in serving on boards. The question is really getting that matching function going. We'll wrap it up there on an optimistic note. Um, Penny, thank you so much for joining me on Growth TV. Thank you so much for having me. This is really terrific.